Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Good morning, Hylon. I just want to welcome you on this, this Mother's Day, and, and I have a special word for our, our women of the church. Um, I believe that, that God has a special interest in women, how they can just lift the world and, and help him as he comforts. As we, as we read through Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 through 31, I want you to consider who is this woman that, that is spoken of in this chapter. When we talk about the virtuous woman, there is um, a word for that in our, our Hebrew culture where the men at the table, as they praise the Lord for the food that they have and they praise God, they also take that time to, to praise their wives for, and the mothers for their provision and their goodness. And there will say a praise called the Ishet Chayil. And Eshet Chayil is translated to woman of valor. So who is the woman of valor that Eshet Chayil is praising? Who can find a virtuous woman? Eshet Chayil, woman of valor, strength and dignity, for her price is above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all of the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still yet night and gives meat to her household and portion to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her candle does not go out by night. She lays her hands to the spindle and holds the staff. She stretches out her hand to the poor and yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known at the gates, and when he sits among the elders of the land, she makes fine linen, sells it, and delivers girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in times to come. She opens up her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Happy Mother's Day, Ashet Chayil, woman of valor. Good morning, Hylon. And this morning we're taking a look at something that's hopefully a lot cheerier than what we've been talking about over the last couple of Sundays, and that is Christian hope. That is the certainty that we have through Christ our Lord. And let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being a God that loves us. We thank you for the difference that you make in our lives, for being the God, the Holy One of Israel, who loved a fallen creation so much that you gave a sacrifice for us. Now fill us with the spirit of hope as we dive into your word. Bless the reading, the teaching. Bless the hearts of those in the sound of my voice. And it's in the matchless name of Christ we pray. Amen. While we live in this fallen world, we're often tempted to look around us and think that, well, this is it. That the problems, the anxiety, and the stresses of today are all that really exists. And that all that we, and that, and that, that 
the problem, the storm, is all that we have to focus on. Earthly wisdom tells us that anything else is impractical. Even faith itself, religion, spirituality, whatever you want to call it, is impractical because it gets in the way of dealing with the problem. But the Word of God teaches us something much different. The voice of Jesus Himself tells us from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6.25, Do not worry about your life, what you eat, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not much more valuable to God because you are made in His image? But here's the thing we need to underline in the text can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the answer is a resounding no. In fact, we've learned through medical science that, if anything, worry, anxiety, and the resulting par uh, emotional paralysis that comes from that shortens our lives. Jesus was asking a rhetorical question, but his point far beyond empirical, before the empirical evidence, was that stress will steal away the hours of your life from you. We are not saved by works. We are not saved by worry. We are saved by the blood of Christ. But Christian life is not about living in a state of constant panic and fear. We were saved to enjoy constantly the peace and the joy and the love that can only come from being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Colossians 1, 3 through 6 tells us, and that's the, the core text for today. We thank always, we, excuse me, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Paul points to the Christian hope as something that has been stored up and set aside. Something that God Himself has placed under guard and sheltered and is keeping close to His heart for you something that is actually accessible to us now as ambassadors in this fallen world. And at his triumphant, in our triumphant homecoming with him, when we physically enter into the kingdom of heaven, where a hope that is now being kept under the care of God will be fully realized. Yours to embrace eternally. that can never be taken away. When we talk about hope from the Christian perspective, we're not talking about just a vacant wish we're not talking about a guess without anything to back it up or good thoughts the way that this society thinks about it. The Greek word Paul actually wrote down is elpis. I think that I'm saying that right. Elpis, which is more directly translated as a joyful or confident expectation. Notice the word confident, certainty. In this case, it speaks of eternal salvation. The word implies a confidence that even defies logic, any rational thought, a certainty of deliverance and provision that worldly knowledge cannot break because the love of God has made it inevitable. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 5, also tells us, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose for salvation, for sanctification, for being a Christ-like representative on earth. This very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, His presence, as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, 
and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are home in the body or away from it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Ironically, many Christians never get serious about their eternal destiny. Either they associate heaven directly with death or they compartmentalize it as something that they think about when they have time. Something I'll get around to when I retire. Something that'll be important a few years down the road, but that certainty is important for us today. It becomes important to us from immediately before salvation because it's one of the reasons that Christ is so passionate about getting the gospel into our hearing. Get in. It's the reason that we should be confident and, and, and we should be passionate about reaching out to others with the gospel despite the conversation, despite the fears, despite the, the, the awkwardness of that five minutes because their soul has an eternal destiny. They will live forever. The question is where? <clears throat> There's only one option aside from being in God's presence. Nevertheless, a lot of our brothers and sisters regard heaven as a potential distraction from the really important things, the more practical things in life. Such thoughts, such worldly concerns threaten to rob us of the joy and the peace that God has designed for us to provision us for victorious living as messengers of His grace which we as Christians are called to be under, to live in. In such a state of blindness, we lose our grip on our convictions about our citizenship in heaven, about living a resurrected life, a Christ-like living, a Christ-like existence in our conduct, our conversation, and our character before others. It blinds us from the position that we hold as children of the living God. Many of us don't even know what the Bible says about heaven. So there tends to be a lot of confusion and a lot of unbiblical thinking about what it is that God is holding for us after this life and what He's credited for our use in this life. So for today, we're going to be diving into the Scriptures that provide insight into our eternal destiny and the hope that is ours through Christ Jesus. I'm going to give these topics to you in the Scriptures. First is that heaven is the place where the eternal presence of God resides. Not as short as I would have liked to, got, to, to have gotten it, but the truth is there. Heaven is the place where the Shekinah glory, where the fullness of God's glory, not as limited to, but the fullness, the expectant, able to see Him for all that He is, dwells in heaven. And this is probably the most important aspect of heaven. Heaven can be either th thought of as the kingdom of God comprised of all the redeemed of earth as well as all of the heavenly host, but it's also the physical capital of that kingdom. It is the place that the tabernacle and later the temple of Jerusalem were built to represent where the Shekinah glory and the presence of God reigns over the universe with Jesus seated at his right hand, interceding on our behalf. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus teaches his followers how to pray in Matthew 5, 16, remember he refers to God as our Father, which art in heaven. A real place from which the sovereign creator of all existence reigns forever. So heaven is also the place where Jesus ministers as our high priest. After the resurrection, Jesus returned physically to the presence of God the Father, where he continues to this day to minister on our behalf with the throne room of the universe itself. In Hebrews 4.14, 4, Hebrews 4.14, 4, if you haven't got this highlight in your Bible, do it now. We read, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not 
sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, boldly, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Christ is there, the very presence of God, pleading on our behalf. Next thing about heaven I want you to know is that heaven is the place that God has prepared for us. Unlike what we've seen portrayed in the movies or on TV, heaven isn't just a bunch of clouds where we all float around playing harps. Heaven is described in the Bible as a place specifically prepared for the children of God, fulfilling the prophetic pattern set up by the Jewish wedding, the rituals, the Jesus the groom tells the disciples in the early, and as the early church fathers, the church who is his bride in John 14, 2 through 3, and I'm using the King James in this one. He tells them that in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. It's also a very exclusive neighborhood. No pain, no illness, no temptation, no sin can enter into the presence of God. Nothing unholy can come into the gates. According to John, in Revelation 21, 3 through 4, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. and He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he continues on in verse 27, Nothing impure will ever enter nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those who name, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're a child of God, your name is there today, and He holds it for you. Your sin has been forgiven, and any unrighteousness that has stained your soul has been covered by Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' blood, has washed you, washed the sin away. Your heart of stone has been replaced by the Holy Spirit with a heart of flesh, a heart in rhythm with the will of God. This is perfect sanctification that we will realize when we close our eyes for the, for the last time and, and open them in the presence of Almighty God. Perfect sanctification. The goal of the Christian life will be fully realized there. The Word of God tells us also, though, that this is not a retirement community. In Revelation 22, 3, Jesus, excuse me, John continues with, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in that city, and His servants will serve Him. Which tells us that based on our effectiveness as ambassadors for the kingdom in the here and now, we, as God's children, are later going to be given the royal positions in the kingdom. Because in Matthew 25, 23, Jesus also tells us, as he's describing the judgment in a parable, he tells that the souls of those found to be under his grace, who have been faithful in their servant service, well done, my good and faithful servant, and pay attention to this next part, you have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge, I will make you rulers over many. Come and share your master's happiness. Just being present in heaven isn't the end of the story. There's still a place of prominence and service that we have in store for us based on our diligence and faithfulness in this life. Discipleship has responsibilities and it has an impact on the hereafter besides just making it. Next thing that I want you to jot down is that heaven is our home. Not just when we, not just when we perish, but it's where we have our citizenship now. Salvation is a prerequisite for citizenship in heaven. <clears throat> and there's only one alternative in this after, in our afterlife, in any afterlife, 
And that is condemnation eternally, separated from the presence of God. Salvation is identified by a person having a personal relationship with God, which was established by Christ through His death, burial, and resurrection, and their receiving of that sacrifice by grace through faith. One well, of the hallmarks of a person who claims this world as their home instead is that in their estimation, in, in their spiritual blindness, that there's no such thing as sin, and therefore nothing to worry about. That the word sin simply means that you've made a mistake, or that the difference between what's right and what's wrong can be decided by a person, by an individual, that it's subjective. In other words, that there's no such thing as universal truth, no such being as God. But the voice of Jesus himself proclaims a universal truth in the coming judgment when he says in John 3.18, speaking of himself, that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's only begotten Son. Condemnation is a state that exists from the moment that we can reasonably discern the difference between right and wrong when we reach the age of accountability. But when we feel that conviction on our heart, when we experience the effect in tandem of the Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Word of God being preached in our midst, when we realize that state, when we set down our sin and our pride and we take up instead the Lordship of Christ, and earnestly repent of our sin, then we become a citizen of heaven. Both right now, as taking up the cause of being His ambassadors in foreign territory, in a fallen world, in the enemy's camp, ambassadors on the other side, but soon to be with Him in the golden city, which is our everlasting home. When, though, when John writes to us about uh, those who dwell upon the earth in the book of Revelation, he's not talking about geography. He's talking about holding a citizenship in this fallen place. The people that identify with the fallen, with the unjust, with the proud, with the blind, those who deny the sovereignty of God in favor of these self-rationalizations and pride rebellious against God, those who are existing in a state of spiritual death, but again, if you're a child of God, this world is enemy territory. And you're called to be a living witness, an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, set on mission. All of us, not just the ordained, every child of God with the, with, with the message in hand that Christ is willing to save. A mission to help others to defect and to embrace salvation by grace, through faith, before it is everlastingly too late. We have to be careful not to become too attached to the things of this world, because we know in our hearts that they're only temporary. Paul reminds us in Philippians 3.19, Philippians 3.19-20, that for those who claim their citizenship on earth, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. These are those that identify as citizens of earth. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from here, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a Christian, people look at you differently because you are different. If you have the influence of the Holy Spirit in you, with you, and upon you, you are not the same as everybody else. In your conduct, in your conversation, in your character, you have an impact if you let Him shine. You are on mission for the kingdom, who by your actions and by what people hear and what people see, you give evidence by your very nature that the rebellion of this world will soon be overthrown and that the gospel is the only real path to rescue. So I also want you to know that heaven is your inheritance. Once we have been saved by faith in Christ, repent, <clears throat> repenting of our sin, claiming Jesus' sacrifice, claiming Jesus' Lord, 
The Bible does not just call us servants or worshipers or friends. Paul explains to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The living and dwelling presence of Almighty God is the down payment on a future inheritance in the kingdom of heaven itself. In Romans 8.15, he continues, when he teaches us that the spirit you have received does not make you slaves. Slaves in the way that you were slaves to sin. Slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you have received brought you brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him, we cry, Abba, Father. We cry, Daddy. It is a familiar term, a term of love, a term of intimacy, a term of embrace. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now, underline this in your copy of God's Word, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Princes and princesses of God, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. If you are in Christ, you are a prince or princesses of the very kingdom of this universe. Jesus is the firstborn of our family. Royalty of the living God. And God is a perfect father, possessing a perfect love. God does not disown His children. The Apostle Peter also writes to us in 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5. This is precious. Please note this in the margin of your Bible. 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. That we are sealed with the certainty that we have an into an, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, not by you, for you, who through faith are shielded, protected by God's God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Next point, heaven is where our treasure is. We do not work in order to get saved or to stay saved. We work for the kingdom because we have been saved. Because we are a different people. A people identified by a love for God, love for our neighbors, and love for each other. Just as salvation brings us into the presence of Almighty God, progressive sanctification, a willingness to do the work and to be a disciple of Christ, that sanctification brings everlasting rewards kept for us until we see our Heavenly Father face to face. Many confuse the presence of heaven with the rewards in heaven that come after the judgment. Many dismiss them as unimportant and say something like, as long as I get in, I'm fine. But God takes them seriously. God in His perfect love for His children has put His own holy reputation on the line for offering rewards for diligence in service and in love. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told those who would be persecuted for His name's sake in Matthew 5, 12, to rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in, not from, not of, in heaven. If you're a Christian, your hope, by definition, cannot be found in money or property. Anything that can be bought can deteriorate, can devalue. Anything earthly you gain, you can lose. And nothing that we have right now will be able to enjoy when we die. You can't take it with you. The only thing that will last is your relationship with Christ and the treasures that we will earn through a Christ-like life. Part of the potential rewards in Scripture include the crown of life in James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10. A crown that is reserved for those who persevere in holding on to loving God and, consistful, and consistently being faithful through trials, through persecutions and temptations. There is also a crown reserved for soul winners, those who are faithful in being ready and always willing to share the hope that comes through the gospel. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. There is a crown of righteousness that Paul describes in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, 
that's reserved for those who faithfully live out their calling as part of the ministry, not just ordained, but any divine calling in this life, met with honor, integrity, and devotion. Those who live in imitation of Christ's conduct, his conversation, and his character, and yet do so while living well in today's time. And long still for his return. For those that have been called for Christian leadership as a deacon, pastor, or teacher, any minister of the gospel, mentoring others in this life, there is reserved a crown of glory for this particular reward comes to us through responsibly living and working as well as being a servant. Someone who is given authority so that they can turn around and then empower others. Peter describes this in 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. Willing, in other words, to follow God's calling on your heart. As God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to your flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Finally, heaven is ready for a homecoming. In 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 6, Paul writes to us that we are always confident and we know that as long as we are home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And we long for that day. In short, when a believer dies, that person enters into a time of rest that's in the presence of Almighty God, waiting for the day of the Lord and the resurrection of all the children of our Heavenly Father. There we will stand united with those who have gone on before. We have this certainty that our friends, our relatives, all those lost through the passage of time, if they are in Christ, we will see them again. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul explains further, that death is not the end when he pins for us, brothers and sisters. We do not want you to be uninformed about the, those who have fallen asleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Write and underline this down. According to the Lord's word, We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a shout, and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, all that are still alive and are left will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. No matter what we face in this life, our eternal hope is certain. Provided by God and protected by God. And whether we enter into God's presence, when we enter into God's presence, everything will be made perfect, just as it was intended for us from the beginning. We are confronted with problems, trials, and griefs in this life. We can find hope, though, in the comfort of knowing that the Lord personally has prepared a place for us, knowing the fullness of God's love and our position granted for us as part of his kingdom. That love should compel us as we live this life to live as best we can a way that fully reflects the goodness and the love of His Son. So we need to ask ourselves, have we really seriously thought about the meaning and purpose of our life in the here and now? More importantly, are we confident and secure? Are you confident and secure with where you will be in the hereafter? The only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but by me, we read in John 14, 6. 
for those who put their faith in his sacrifice for salvation, they can rest assured that they will join him in a place prepared just for them, a hope that nothing can shatter. One of the things that I've taught you before is that there's a prophetic pattern set up in the Jewish marriage ceremony. The husband approaches his bride-to-be, presents her with a cup of wine. If she drinks it, she accepts it. And at that moment, they're betrothed. A much more serious relationship than we think about when we, when we think about a, an engagement in today's time. Then he goes to his father's house. And under his father's watch care, the son builds an addition that will be theirs. He prepares a place for it. And when that place is fully prepared, when that place is finished, the father inspects it. And when it meets with his approval, he tells his son, go and get your bride. And in this ritualistic kind of kidnapping, the bride-to-be and all of her closest friends are sitting keeping watch by night with their lamps trimmed and burning, waiting for the day. We, right now, are waiting for that day as the bride of Christ, redeemed at the expense of his blood, waiting for that day that we know will come. So while we wait, we learn and we grow. We become disciples in every sense of the word. And while we watch, we work by being sources of hope, peace, joy, and love to a world trapped in darkness. Messengers in a foreign land until one day we are called home where we will be in the embrace of our beloved for all time and in the company of all those that we love who have gone before. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for a hope that is certain, for the peace that it brings, for the comfort that we have and the joy that we have, because where you are, one day soon, we will also be. And if there are any within the sound of my voice that have yet to know that peace, that have yet to know the fullness of that love, Lord, trouble their hearts. May they make now a decision for you to lay their burdens aside, to repent of their pride, to seek you for forgiveness, to accept the sacrifice of your Son, and to become a citizen of heaven, both in the here and now, and every day hereafter. And it's in the matchless name of Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you and keep you this day and for always. And until we meet again. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share His Word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you and may God bless you and keep you.